<laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the DevNet uh, Create Theater. Next up, we have our DevNet's very own Tom Davies, uh, Pioneer Award winner, who's going to uh, talk to us about blockchain. Good topical uh, topic to talk about. And it is. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. I like a clap before we've even started. That's quite, quite, keep that going if you want. So uh, I've got you for 45 minutes. Um, so this session is all about uh, blockchain and how to create uh, tokens and currency on it. So at the end of this session, I'll be a millionaire, <laughs> which is awesome for me. Uh, and then you will have the opportunity to buy some coins, and you can go and do that either after this session or beyond. But the idea is to get you into the mindset of developing on blockchain and what blockchain is. Uh, my name is Tom Davis. Uh, I am a senior manager of with DevNet. Uh, I've been lots of years uh, in senior management and enterprise architecture and such. You can tell because my hairline's receding very badly these days. Uh, and basically, I very much I'm interested in new technologies and movements in software, so things like serverless before serverless was the thing it is now, and even blockchain for the last three or four years. Uh, I kind of like to get involved in those and evangelize around those topics. I also head up DevNet Sandbox, which is the circular booth in the main hall. So if you want to chat to me after about any of this, just come and find me in the main hall. I'll be there for a couple of days. So the agenda today, so uh, the first thing I'm going to do is go through the technical fundamentals of blockchain pretty quickly. So quick pop quiz. How many people know the difference between, say, Bitcoin and blockchain? Quite a few. That's pretty good. How many people uh, have actually developed on a blockchain before? Nice. Zero. That's good. Uh, so that's what I'm hoping to do today. So I'm going to rattle through some fundamentals for like in 10 minutes to tell you about how blockchain kind of works and the general mechanisms around it and what it can offer. And then I'll get through all that and then come into uh, how to actually make yourself a token millionaire. Uh, and how the toolings around blockchain tool chains and how to then develop your own contracts and deploy them onto a blockchain and then how to observe what's happening in that blockchain. Got to do all that in 45 minutes. Well, 42 minutes and 29 seconds now, so we've got to be quite rapid. Uh, if at any point you've got questions, do remember I'm around for a couple of days and I'll answer them, no problem. And then you get the opportunity to buy some DevNet coin, some, some tokens that I'm going to create today for you. I know you're really lucky, I can tell. Uh, so let's go through the blockchain fundamentals to begin with. So first of all, what is a blockchain? So a bunch of you, it looks like you kind of know, but some may not. So blockchain is actually just a transactional database. When you join a blockchain, you get a full copy of that whole database. So if we were all in a blockchain, we are taking part in a blockchain and putting transactions in a blockchain, we'd all have a full copy of that blockchain. No one entity controls that blockchain. It's completely decentralized. That's a word you'll hear a lot with blockchain. It's a decentralized tool, which means not one entity has control over the transactions that go in it. We all put transactions into it, and it self-governs. And it's cryptographically secure. A lot of cryptography involved in this. And it's called a trustless network. Now, in Cisco, when you say trustless network, people freak out and go, oh my god, trustless network? Can't have that. But in in block ter blockchain terms, that's a really good thing, to be able to have a trustless network where I can transact on it, not trust any of you guys at all, but know my transactions are valid, is a really powerful tool. So we have transactions that are rolled up into blocks, and then those blocks are chained together. Block, chain. Amazing. Right, so how does that then work? How do we transact on a blockchain, or what does a transaction look like? So I'm going to take the trivial use case of buying a cup of coffee, because it's easy. So let's say Alice uh, wants to transact and buy a coffee with some Bitcoin. First of all, she needs to have an account. An account consists, effectively, when you create one, you get given a private key, and a public key gets broadcast to the entire blockchain. That public key is where people send you money or transactions. 
So that public address is essentially your ID on the blockchain. You also get a private, private ID. You keep that to yourself, private key. Now, when you go and buy a cup of coffee, you need to send the money to the person who's you're buying a cup of coffee off, in this case, coffee shop. They've got the same thing. They'll have an account, and on that account, they'll have a public address and a private address that they keep them to themselves. So if I need to send money to the coffee shop, I use their public address, and I say, I want to send a very small amount of crypto, like Bitcoin in this case, over to the coffee shop to buy my coffee. Uh, <clears throat> and I send that to the public key. I sign it, this is the key bit, key bit, this is the crucial bit, I sign it with the private key, my private key. And when I sign it with my private key and send it into the blockchain, that makes it transactionally sound. At no point do you want to give your private key to anybody else, because at that point they will drain your account or just put transactions into the blockchain on your behalf. Both of which you probably don't want, so don't do that. Always keep your private key quite private. Uh, so that's how you do a transaction on the blockchain, top level. So here it is in a different picture. You've got all of us in a blockchain all around the world. And once Alice then buys that cup of coffee from the coffee shop, it's broadcast across the world. Everybody can then see that transaction if they so wish. Every transaction that's ever happened on the Bitcoin blockchain, or say Ethereum, you can actually observe and see since the dawn of time. So blocks, so let's talk about blocks. So we talked about what a blockchain is. We've talked about what a transaction kind of looks like at a high level. So what's a block? What is actually a block? So a block's kind of like an IP packet, if you like. It has a header and a body. In the header is things like the blockchain version that we're using. In the, and uh, some other like, details that we won't get into today. In the, in the body itself, a whole bunch of transactions that are being pumped into the blockchain continuously get wrapped up into a block. And I think on the Bitcoin network, it's like every 10 minutes a block's created. So a whole bunch of transactions, there might be like 2,000 transactions in that body. And they get pumped in with things like the, the, uh, the target address, the, uh, the source address and the amount of money. You can see it here. Loads of cryptographic information. And if you decoded it, there'd be that money for that coffee that Alice put in. So that makes up a block. So that all sounds great. I can put a transaction into the blockchain. What's to stop me double spending? What's to stop me completely cheating the system? I could just put, surely then I could just put loads of transactions in. Even if I had one Bitcoin, I could put 20 transactions in for 200 Bitcoin each. And before anybody knew it, I would double spent. Or I could validate my own transactions and say, yeah, I've just paid myself 2,000 Bitcoin. How do we stop that? And that's through a process called mining. Other people have to validate our transactions. And they do that through something called proof of work, which we'll talk about in a minute. So mining has become quite big business, as you've probably seen in, in the public eye. And you can see these mining rigs that go for about 10,000 pounds each that you can buy. And these will make you a few hundred bucks a week. Not even that, I don't think. I think it's like, it takes a while to get your money back off a mining rig but you will eventually. And these are all different types of mining rig that you can buy. So this is touched on proof of work. So a miner has to prove work on your behalf for your transaction to be valid. How do you do a proof of work? So proof of work effectively is you grab the data in the body of a block, and then you grab the header details and then you grab a random number, which is called a nonce. So you've got the data in a block and a nonce, and you ram that through a hashing algorithm. That hashing algorithm is, tends to be unique to that blockchain. What pops out is effectively a number. That number has to have a certain format to it. I forget on the Bitcoin network, but I think it's got to start with something like 60 zeros to be valid. The chances of getting it right first time is something like 10 to the power of 20. Not, not likely, should we say. So it's very CPU intensive. If you don't get it right that time, what you have to do is you have to increase your nonce by one, which is that random number, take all that details from the block again, push it through the algorithm again, and then grab a number, number that comes out the back. 
again, if that doesn't format, you have to do it again and again and again. So that's why you have these mining rigs with just huge amounts of CPU that allow you to do this lots and lots of times. If you manage to do it, then that block becomes validated and gets put into the blockchain and you get a small reward for it. When you do that, you actually validate a whole bunch of transactions on other people's behalf. The reason why this exists is because it comes very hard for people to put bad transactions into a blockchain. You have to have huge amounts of CPU power to be able to validate your own transactions. And unless you have 51% of the CPU power that's actually powering the blockchain, then you'll never be able to control it. So it's pretty much unbreakable. Once you've validated a block, it gets broadcast to the entire network. So in this case, on Bitcoin again, because everybody knows that one, it gets broadcast to the entire network, and everybody knows that that set of transactions in that block are now valid. Clues in the name. Blocks, the head of a block, as well as the uh, version of the blockchain that, is, that we're actually looking at, also has a pointer to the block previous in the chain, creating a chain of blocks, blockchain. Uh, and there's only one winner every time you put, every time somebody does a proof of work, the first person to actually prove that, that set of transactions is valid wins. Even if you came second by a set by one, if you came second by say a millisecond, you still wouldn't get paid for it. So only the first person wins. And it encourages people to be honest, basically, on compute resources. In the Bitcoin world, again, you've got 21 million coins have been created. That's 75% of all that will ever, ever exist. And that's what's driving the, the, basically the value of Bitcoin, because it's like gold, effectively. So even though we're supposed to be buying anything with Bitcoin, like coffee and pizza, it's actually becoming much more of a kind of a, uh, something analogous to gold, where you would buy it to keep it and store it, because it's such a limited resource. OK, then. So to talk about one blockchain is not accurate anymore. There are lots of blockchains out there. For the rest of this talk, I'm actually going to focus on another type of blockchain called Ethereum. The reason why I'm going to talk about Ethereum is because it allows Turing complete code to be stored on it. What that means is I can program on it and then deploy those programs to the blockchain and then call them. To, do, to execute that code. These pieces of code are called smart contracts, incredibly poorly named mechanism. It's not smart, it's not really a contract. It's actually just logic, code logic. And when you store that on a blockchain, it gets a public ID, and when you want to execute that code, you call a public ID, same as a coffee shop would have, same principle. When you first started coding on blockchain, when it was first released, Ethereum, a couple of years back, it was like the, it, you had to have a PhD just to code on the thing and deploy a contract. The tokens, uh, the, the, the ecosystem's getting a lot better for tools now, and I'm going to go through some of the ecosystems of tools that we have out there today to help us, and then I'll look at a, a contract live, and then we'll talk about the tool chains as well and show you some of those things. A little bit more of a touch on smart contracts. So you can see here, People, blockchain, smart contract built on the blockchain. Three types of ways you can trigger them. Number one, you can call them and say, execute my code explicitly. Number two, they could be on a timed interval to say, in three weeks, execute. And then the other one is an event. Say, my company's become extremely popular. I want to pay people tokens out when I reach a billion pounds. On that date, via all of my tokens to the people that invested in me. They're the way to actually call these codes, pieces of code. So to recap, the stored procedures, tool is increasing. Anyone can make their own contracts. So actually, anybody can make their own crypto tokens. So hopefully, after this, you can go away and build your own crypto tokens. Or you can buy mine, which is better for me. Um, the, the platform to run on. Is, could be blockchain, it could be Bitcoin, it could be Ethereum, it could be Stellar, it could be IOTA. There's hundreds of blockchains out there now. And you have to be careful with how you write smart contracts. 
if you, there's no real standards for writing a good smart contract right now, and there's loads of holes in them. So like one, one case recently was the uh, DAO uh, stuck to about, I don't know, a lot of money into one of their contracts to distribute out. There was a, a flaw in it, and they lost 3.6 million before anybody could stop it being drained. Be careful when you write them. So that's how it would work if you were building an application on a blockchain. You'd have the database, effectively like a decentralized database, which is a sessions a blockchain. Then you have the smart contract logic on top. If you build a user interface, you've effectively got an indestructible application because you, on your computers, execute all the code for me. If anybody leaves one blockchain, I've still got the rest of you to execute my code for me, and I pay you to execute my code. So in that sense, I've got an indestructible application. One last note before we get into some fun code stuff. Two types of blockchain. One is public, like Ethereum, like Bitcoin. Anybody can join them. We could all join them in the room right now if we wanted to. The second is a permission type, private. These are different, tend to be different code bases, and they're specific to either one company, private, or a community, which is like a set of banks working together that just want their transactions to be seen by those banks and not the whole public, for example. So different types of blockchain to use. OK, so that gives you a level set on blockchain. So now we can start talking about the tools, why we have the tools, what we want to do, and basically how we deploy a contract. And we want to get to where 50 Cent is. Do, we, do you, remember, you remember 50 Cent? Remember that he, used, he was one of the first artists to actually accept Bitcoin payment for his music? Totally forgot all about it. Years came back to it. He's like 7 million worth of Bitcoin in his bank account. Nice to misplace seven million pounds, or dollars, I suppose. So we want to get there. Here is a list of kind of the tokens that exist today. So if you go to CoinMarketCap, it'll tell you all the tokens like this. There's reams of them. There's, there's one more since I created my, co my token as well. But these all have a market cap, and they are value associated with them. And you can see the Bitcoin is like 118 billion in circulation. The next is Ethereum, which we're going to focus on today. Got quite a lot of that too. And I took this on Sunday. These values have probably changed because it's a complete roller coaster on value, as you probably know. Okay. So, what we're going to do today is I'm going to do an initial coin offering and I'm going to create DevNet coin. So, the initial coin offering is effectively a way of creating tokens for people then to buy so I can build up money and then give you something back for that coin. So I might say, I'm going to build the best rocket ship in the world. And when I do that, I'm going to take you to Mars. And you go, that sounds great. I'll buy some of your tokens. And I'll take you to Mars when I've got a ship to do it. But I need money to do it in the first place, so you give me the money. Unfortunately, if you buy a debit coin, you get exactly nothing back. But I get your money. So it's quite the bargain for me. Um, this is how it's going to work. So I'm going to show you a contract in a minute. And this is effectively what it will do. The contract is going to create 20 million tokens. And they're going to be DevNet coin tokens. It's going to be of a certain standard. The ERC20 standard is an effort to say, your contracts must have these functions and these procedures in them and do these things. And you try and adhere to that. My symbol is going to be dev. Now, I'm going to pay myself immediately 5 million DevNet coin. Yes. Simple as that, I'm a millionaire. My partner in crime, a guy called Val, he, uh, he's going to get 5 million too, just because I like him. And the rest is 10 million goes out for you guys to buy. You're so lucky today, I tell you. Bet you didn't think about this when you came here this morning. Uh, and if you give me one ETH, which is one ETH, ETH basically is a currency on Ethereum. So if you give me one ETH, I'll give you 100 DevNet coin. What a bargain, 100 to 1. Does that sound like a good ICO? It does to me. Sounds great to me. Now, the ERC20 standard is this URL here. And you can look it up, boy yourself census with it. But I'm going to show you it in code in a minute. Before I get there, I want to talk about some tools. So we're going to get into the tools piece. We've level set. I've talked about like the Ethereum the ICO I'm going to create. This is the kind of starting going into the tools, the tool set that we need. So when we write a contract, it's kind of three stages we have to think about. You have to think about writing them, then how do I deploy them, and then where am I going to deploy them? I don't want to just deploy them straight onto 
uh, like the, the public network, what happens if I've got a bug in them and you drain all my money out of my account? That would make me sad. Don't want that to happen. So we need some kind of test network as well. And it's kind of like different IDEs and different methodologies for doing this. So there's like uh, Remix, for example, which is an in-browser IDE. I'll show you that. And there's also Parity, which is another IDE. But that you deploy that to your local laptop and use it from there, for example. You can also just use text editors, things like Atom or Vim or whatever you're comfortable with. It doesn't have to be an IDE, of course. But these are helpers to get you started. And then deploying them, again, you've got kind of command line and you've got user interface based or like uh, web based. Truffle is a command line, kind of a bit of a command line junkie, so I might use a bit of Truffle today. But we've also got things like MetaMask. MetaMask is awesome, especially for beginners in the blockchain world because it protects you from phishing scams and things like that. And you'll see that. It's a plugin for the Chrome browser. And believe me, there are a lot of phishing scams when it comes to blockchain. So having some protection about making sure you go into the right URL is super important. And then there's things to make accounts and actually deploy these contracts, or so things like my Ether Wallet. And I'll show you my Ether Wallet, which is another great tool. And on a platform level, you've got the Ethereum public blockchain, which is like your production network at home, for example, or in your business or company. And then you've got things like staging environments. One of them in Ethereum is something called Covan. There's another one called Rinkspay. They've all got pretty funky names that you'll never remember for a while. But uh, we're going to use Covan today as our staging environment. <clears throat> Covan's like an exact copy of Ethereum, except for it's just got uh, money that's not tied to any real value. They call it KEF instead of ETH. Covan, ETH, KEF. Uh, and you can get KEF quite readily from, I'll show you a, a way to do that. And then you can play using that fake money. And that's actually how you can buy my tokens using this fake money on a staging environment rather than throwing your hard earned cash at some guy stood on a stage you've never met before, which is probably better for you. Um, so they're the three stages, and we'll walk through those. What would that look like in kind of a tool chain? Something like this. So you might have a user interface based and a command line based. And the user interface based, if I was going to go that way, I'd use something like Remix. I'd write my, I'd write my contract. I'd deploy it to MetaMask. And then I'd deploy it onto Covan. And then I'd get my contract ID back and broadcast that so people can give me buy the tokens. Or I might do command line, where I go to the Atom text editor which I use, then I might deploy it via Truffle onto the Covan test network again. And then I get my contract ID, and I'll show you how to inspect it later. One note on Solidity. Solidity is what you're going to see in a minute, and that's the contract programming language of Ethereum. It's actually not just Ethereum. There's a lot of programming language. Uh, there's a lot of blockchains that use Solidity. It's quite a common one. And that's pretty good, because you write your contract, and then it can go on different blockchains, which is quite nice. Uh, might need some tweaks, but principles there. Uh, there's, if you want to read about Solidity, uh, amazing URL there. So without further ado, I'll show you a Solidity contract. So if I go to the Atom editor, what I have here, which is pretty small, it's better for you, is uh, my contract that I'm going to deploy. And you can see here that it's Solidity, a certain version. First thing you have to do is some safe maths, because you're dealing with like really small pieces of uh, value a lot of the time in decimal places. If you get your maths wrong, you'll end up with like leftovers. It'll break the contract. So we do some safe math to make sure that that never occurs. Then we have this contract interface, which is effectively lists all the kind of uh, functions that you need to be ERC20 compliant contract. So, can I get the total supply? What's the balance? How much am I allowed to buy? Can I, I need to be able to transfer it to other accounts. I need to be able to approve that, for example. And then I need events like an event, a transfer event or an approval event. <coughs> then we wander into the actual contract. So my contract's called DevNet Coin. It's of the ERC20 type. I do a lot of definitions that you won't be interested in. But I also pass in two um, addresses. One for Val, one for me. So when we actually go and struct the <clears throat> contract, I give it a name. My symbol is dev, as we talked about. Total supply is 20 million. 5 million for me, 5 million for Val, 10 million for you to buy. 
and then I give a quarter of each to me and Val. Then we have other functions like get the account quantity, total supply, actually implementing the functions that we need uh, that was created in the constructor to start off with. And then I won't go into too much detail here, but then there's like transfer, approve it, and then the code just to basically send the tokens. Once you buy them, I keep your ETH, and then you get the DevNet tokens back to your public address. And that's how we do it with buy VXT. Um, one other thing to notice, I guess, is the self-destruct. So contracts, once you deploy them onto a blockchain, they live forever. It's brilliant except for if you tell them to self-destruct. So if I, want, if I want to give you money, for, uh, you want to give me money for DevNet coin, for example, then that, you give me an ETH, I give you the DevNet coin, that ETH doesn't get transferred until I self-destruct this contract. Which is good for me again, because when I self-destruct it, I've just put my name in there, not Val's. So actually I get all the money and I stiff my partner effectively. So I love this contract. Don't tell Val I said that. So um, he's probably watching on streaming. So anyway, so I've got this contract that I can now use, uh, and I can kill it when I want, and that money will go into my account, unless I actually draw out of that contract the money as it goes. So I can actually draw out whenever I want, but if you self-destruct, it automatically goes to me, to be truthful. Okay, so that's the basic contract of creating my own token, 197 lines of code, including curly brackets. So not actually that difficult at all. Okay, so let's say I've created that contract and now I want to deploy it. So you can see I used Atom, created my contract, want to deploy it. I'm gonna use Truffle to deploy it, but you could use a lot of different things. So if I go to uh, Google for a minute, uh, I'll show you in a browser. This is a remix Solidity IDE. So if, if I was going to use, I use the text editor like Atom, but you could actually write your contract in, uh, so, uh, pardon me, in remix, which is the browser-based version of it, and that's an IDE. So you can see that it's actually compiled it for me here, so I know it's quite safe. I can actually then run it and deploy it just from this window, which is quite nice. Um, what I'm gonna do now though is deploy it via the command line just so you can see that working as well and I won't deploy it via the user interface. So if I go to uh, my command window, Truffle is basically, as you'd expect, it's like a, an, M an MVM install, so I just do MVM install. And then what I do, if I go here, you can see that I've got a DevNet coin folder. And when I first start working with Truffle, I just do Truffle in it and it creates, scaffolds me a whole folder set that I need. So in here, if I go uh, LS, you see it's got a contracts and migrations folder, and it's also got a truffle JS. So if I go more truffle JS, you can see that I've got, I've actually validated, I've actually said, I want three networks. I want a, a development network to be local to my laptop. I want a Covan network, which is deploy it to stage, or I want the main network, my Ethereum public network, and I want to deploy it to Ethereum. So effectively, I've got development stage and my public you know, production system. So it's kind of the same as you would develop not on blockchain. Uh, if I escape that out. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna now deploy my contract that I've shown you. So all I need to do to do this is truffle migrate. Migrate is like deploy, but in truffle terms. So I migrate my contract onto the blockchain. So truffle migrate. I'm gonna reset, which means Truffle actually keeps track of your migrations. Um, it's a bit of a funky mechanism, but it keeps track of your migrations. So if you, uh, it's like a version control of your contract and it updates the latest version for you and gives you a new uh, public ID for you to, to aim at. So we'll reset that, so we'll start it from scratch. And I wanna say, network Covan. I'm gonna aim at the staging network. And that's all I should need to do. Uh, and assuming I'm connected to the network, which I am, it will start those migrations. So it'll start iterating and say, right, okay, this is, you've reset, so this is a new migration. Uh, I'll replace all the other migrations, I'll, I'll deploy that, and then I'll start deploying your new contract. Now, when this executes, it'll do a few things. It'll create my token, it'll make me a millionaire, 
instantly, round about now, I'm a millionaire. I'm loaded. Uh, and then uh, Val becomes a millionaire too, and the rest of the money uh, you can now buy. You're so lucky. I'm surprised you haven't cracked your laptops out and are just like, sending me money in droves. Um, so what I've just done there, there, I've gone deploy the network contract, um, is deployed the contract. So what I've done is I created my contract, I deployed it using Truffle, the funds have been created, it's deployed onto the Covan network, it's built my little, little token, and it sent me the contract ID back. So that's great. Except for you're going, I didn't really see any of that. You could have done what you liked. I saw, one, I saw you write one line of code and show me a contract. So how would you actually see what's happened on a blockchain? I could be telling you anything. So you actually want observability into a blockchain. And originally, that was really hard to do. But now we've got some decent tools for that, too. So what I'm going to introduce you to now is uh, I'm going to flick around like crazy first. And then I'm going to show you uh, MetaMask. So we got quite a few features. I'll get rid of Remix, leave that. Um, and we'll go on to for it. So I'm going to show you a few tools to talk about observability and how you can look and create wallets. So the first thing uh, you'll want to do is I'm going to go to MetaMask. And I, if you do get involved in this and you want to actually play with this afterwards, I'll show you how to do that. Don't worry. Um, I fully uh, suggest that you download MetaMask. It's a brilliant tool. Um, what I've got here is the MetaMask plugin. It's a little fox. And you can see that I have some accounts on that little plugin there. Really easy to create accounts, very hard to delete them. So I've now got like, a couple of unused accounts, but I've got like, a, a, some, some used accounts that I use here. So if I go to my Create DevNet Coin account, you can see that I have some, I'm on the Covan test network as well. Draw that out. So I can change to what network I want as well with, with MetaMask, quite nice. So I'm going to stay on the Covan network. And I've got some KEF in there, which is fake money, essentially. And then I'm going to say, well, I'd like to know more about like, what just happened. I want to see if that coin did get created. And what I can do is go to something called Etherscan. And Etherscan is how I observe the blockchain. So if I click on that, it'll take you to something called covan.etherscan.io. And it will show me my contract and my IDs. And you can see here, uh, if I go to transactions, you see all my latest transactions that have gone to this public address. And see, two minutes ago, uh, I've got like, money going in, money going out, a few different pieces happening there. Uh, what else can I quickly show you on this? Uh, you see that I've sent no money. I think I've just received it. And then if I flick to another account, I can do the same on, say, the DevNet coin account. And I'll do the same there. I'm going to have a look at why my DevNet coin account is. And on this one, I've got token transfers. So I deployed my contracts on the, using the first account. This account is where I actually deployed my 5 million DevNet coins. And you can see three minutes ago that I became obscenely rich. Obscenely rich. And you can also see that I've been playing around a little bit with these DevNet coins, trying to get it right on stage. So I'm actually like 50 million DevNet coin up, except for the only real valid ones are these latest valid ones here. But I have, I have tons. Now, that's great. So you can see here that I can change from MetaMask pretty easy and manage all my accounts from one uh, little plugin, which is really good. So it's another really good, cool tool to use. And that, gives you like a really good amount of observability into what's happening on the network. So I flick back to my slides. So that's pretty much what you just saw. You saw me have an account where I sent my, to I deployed my uh, contract from, and then the account that received those tokens from that. So you've seen inside the blockchain, and that really finishes this tool chain. So I create my contract, I deployed it onto the Corban network, got the ID back, and now I can inspect it. Fantastic. Now, we did this a while back as well. We did this at Cisco Live. And we built a, um, a, a Node.js application so we could also allow you guys to understand how to buy it and track it as well. So if I can flick to that, 
you can go to this now as well. So you can go to devnetcoin.com, and there we have like the official launch of DevNetCoin that you can now buy. If I go down, it actually has instructions for you to, to tell you how to buy it as well. So if I, this is actually the address. I'm going to copy that for a minute. But it will tell you how to buy it. And you can do this after the presentation. Don't worry, you get these slides. You can actually just go to DevNet Coin and follow these uh, instructions to buy them. And you can see lots of people have done that already. And I'm at the top here with 5,300,000, which is brilliant. So how do you actually go about sending a transaction? So now I'm rich. And I want to encourage you to buy some DevNet coin off me. Come on, follow me here. Uh, so I, I actually am going to take you through how to do that so then you can do it. Um, show me how to get some. So the first thing you need to do when you're on the Covan network is actually go to something called the faucet. This is the faucet. You need some money to actually transact on the uh, Covan network. So to do that, all you need to do is go to here and get your public ID from uh, Colvan. So I'm going to say, I want this public ID. So you can do this. Once you've created an account, you can also go to uh, the, the faucet. Oops, pardon me, flicking all around like crazy. And you just put your public ID into this faucet and enter. And that will give you five kef. You can do a lot with five kef, actually, as that happens. And it'll reply and give me five kef, and that's how you then can transact. It actually costs you money to transact on a blockchain. Because as we talked about miners, when I deploy a contract on, they have to validate that that was a valid transaction. My code is still needs to be validated like a valid transaction like anything else. So I need money to be able to do that. He'll reply in a minute and say, here's your five kef. Now, don't be greedy. You can only have five kef every 24 hours. Otherwise, people could just flood the network, the staging network, and bring it down with random transactions. So they send that back. So if I then want to buy some uh, DevNet coin, what do I do? So you can see, see there that we tried. It's like, yeah, no, no, you're not getting any more. You have to try again in a few hours. Don't, don't try that trick on me. We tried a lot. <laughs> Didn't work. Uh, so what we then use is something like my Ether wallet to actually buy some DevNet coin. So how do we do that? Um, so I'm going to flick to my ETH wallet. I love my ETH wallet. It's brilliant. Again, it's kind of like MetaMask. It really protects beginners and even intermediates about how to not get fleeced when working with Bitcoin. The documentation is brilliant. It takes you through, like, don't get fished, come to this address, bookmark it, here's how to interact, and it allows you to create accounts really well. I've already got an account, and what else it does, it plugs into MetaMask. So Whatever I'm logged in as in MetaMask, it will actually log in with uh, my Ether wallet, so I never have to pa provide a password into a public website. It's always in MetaMask. So all my details are in MetaMask, and that applies it for me to any website, so I never have to get fished by putting my private key in anywhere, uh, which is kind of important. So then if I go, and if I want to swap accounts and say, right, I want to buy some I'm going to go to my real DevNet coin account, which is D9BB. So if I go to this DevNet coin account, you can see this is D9BB here. And I'm going to buy 100 DevNet coin to make this 5,400. So if I create myself an account like you guys can, you create yourselves an account, then I'm going to log in. MetaMask currently is logged into that DevNet coin account. So I'm going to say, yep, I want to send some Ether and some tokens. I click on MetaMask and say connect by MetaMask. It goes, great, I've done that. And then you can see I'm on the Covan ETH. I've got some KEF from the faucet already. To the address, you can get that from the DevNet coin website that I just showed you. It's on the Covan ETH network again. And I want to send one, uh, make sure I'm actually logged in by the Covan test network. I am. I'm going to send one ETH, which is 100 DevNet coins. Or I could send two ETH for 200. The gas limit is actually how much you pay for the transfer. And then I generate that transaction. That looks great. I'm going to send that transaction. So it tells me to be secure. This is what you're going to do. Are you sure you want to do it? So you go, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure about that. Oh. And then MetaMask kicks in because it protects you and says, this is what you're going to do. Are you sure you want to do it? So you've got layers of protection there. If you use like, things like my Ether wallet and MetaMask, they connect very well. Uh, so it's hard to spend your money badly 
or people to rip you off. And you can see that we have to spend some money to actually put that onto the uh, blockchain. So I submit that, and it says, great, your transaction's been actually broadcast to the network in staging. And then you can verify that transaction by just clicking that. So it gives you observability into your own transaction too, which is fantastic. So now I've just sent two ETH to my own account to buy some of my own DevNet coin, because five million is just not enough. You need more. So we come here, and if I refresh that, once that transaction has been valid by, validated by the blockchain, uh, then that should increase to uh, five, five, I believe. But we'll have to wait for that to actually um, validate. So that might take a minute or two, depending on how busy that network is. So we won't wait too long for that before I move on. You just have to take my word for it. OK, so that's how you can buy DevNet coin as well. And the instructions to do that are on the DevNet coin website. I encourage you to actually play. The idea is to actually understand the contracts and just basically create your first transaction. And you can use that using DevNet coin. And the reason why you can use it using DevNet coin is because there's no real value behind it. What I've shown you today, obviously, is just a DevNet coin with, that's worth nothing, and you're sending KEF, which is a made-up currency on a staging environment, so you can do it in complete isolation to learn the basics of what I've just taught you through, too. Fantastic. So how do you really create value? Three basic ways. Exchanges. People create tokens and then build an exchange around it and then put it against something like Bitcoin. And then they can generate value from Bitcoin and say, hey, if people start buying my made up coin uh, against Bitcoin, then it actually starts generating value. Even if made up coin starts trading at $1 against a Bitcoin, and you have 2 million made up coins, you suddenly got $2 million from nothing. And I've seen folks do that. Utility coins are things like Kick is a, uh, a teenager kind of messaging app with millions and millions of teenagers that use it. And the way Kik have generate, are going to generate money from their tokens is they have in-app purchases, and they use it a crypto uh, token to buy in-app purchases that in the outside world, they'll tie back to something like dollars, and all of a sudden, they've generated their own money out of their tokens too, because it has value within Kik. And then the third is ICOs, what I talked about before with DevNet coin, where you say, I'm going to build the best company ever, and it's going to have this brilliant product. And when we're all billionaires, I'm going to take any, any tokens that you bought off me are going to be worth, say, £10,000. I'll give you, if you buy two tokens, I'll give you 20000 back. And it's a way of dragging money to actually build a business or build a product and then give back. So it's kind of like shares or a, a funding, effectively. So to tie it all up, just going to flick back to blockchain at Cisco. So, a blockchain at Cisco, we're involved in all the Hyperledger uh, Linux Foundation stuff, so we, we get involved in all the open source pieces. We actually are founding members of the IoT Alliance as well, because blockchain and IoT is like a marriage made in heaven. If you can get machine to machine to talk to each other and transact on people's behalf and take out all the, the middlemen, then that's a fantastic use of blockchain technology. So we're looking into that. Uh, and if you ever want to get started on your own private blockchain, so I've, I've shown you Ethereum today, which is a public blockchain. You can get involved in that. You can see Covamp. If you go to DevNet Sandbox, uh, you can actually spin up your own Hyperledger Fabric private blockchain, the Linux open source that we're a part of. And that will spin you up a private blockchain, and you can learn about the APIs and behind that Hyperledger blockchain, learn about another blockchain that you can transact on in complete isolation, and we'll spin you that up on demand. So that's also a good, fun way of learning about blockchain and also what private blockchains can offer that public blockchains um, might not be as useful for. And on that note, I will say thank you very much. Go buy a whole bunch of DevNet coin. Make me more richer. It's been a pleasure to chat to you. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Awesome. Thank you, Tom. That was great stuff. All right, uh, if you want to stick around, our next discussion is going to be on uh, scaling enterprise DevOps. Um, so that should be a good conversation. <laughs>